Hi, everyone. Welcome to Report from ASCO, what's happening in metastatic breast cancer research and treatment with Dr. Don Dizon. My name is Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Today's webinar is in collaboration with the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. We're thrilled to have Shirley Mertz, the president of MBCN, with us today. Dr. Dizon is board certified in medical oncology and is the clinical co-director of gynecological oncology at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center, where he is also the founder and director of the Oncology Sexual Health Program at MGH Cancer Center. He's an associate professor of obstetrics gynecology and associate professor of medicine at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University and is pending a similar appointment at Harvard Medical School. He serves on multiple national committees and is currently the co-chair of the National Cancer Institute's Gynecological Cancer Steering Committee Cervical Cancer Task Force. Dr. Dizon, welcome and thank you so much. It's all yours. Hi. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's always an honor to work with Cher as well as the, the great folks at um, MBCN. Uh, they have asked me to uh, summarize some of the um, research that was presented at the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, and this presentation will emphasize uh, the work that set out to me on treatments in metastatic breast cancer. So in terms of a summary of what we learned in ASCO, uh, there was one that I did consider as a breakthrough, and it was for women with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, and the results were of the Paloma 3 trial showing um, a benefit two-fold vestrin when it is combined with the biologic CDK4-6 inhibitor palbocyclob, which has been FDA approved for use in uh, metastatic breast cancer already. We did have promising uh, treatments for triple negative metastatic breast cancer um, as well. Uh, and one study that I'll talk about used the poly-ADP ribose phosphorylase inhibitor viliparib and the other an androgen receptor inhibitor called enzalutamide. And then we did have some clarifications in our approaches to women with metastatic breast cancer that is HER2 positive, and those results were from the Marianne study. Another study looking at bevacizumab in hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. And then for women with bone metastases, we had um, some clarifications on how we use the bone, uh, the, the bone strengthening bisphosphonate zoledronic acid, as well as for women who are um, diagnosed with brain metastases, the role of whole brain radiotherapy was discussed. I'll end with some future directions on both targeted treatments as well as immunotherapy, um, which, which uh, draw not only from uh, the ASCO annual meeting, but from the American Association for Cancer Research meeting as well. To get started, what I thought I'd do for this audience was try to make sense of the studies in the probably simplest way possible, and it's how we look at these data uh, when we try to uh, essentially summarize it uh, for ourselves in terms of what they mean. And I'm going to use what is often called the PICO criteria. And PICO stands for P, patients, who was exactly enrolled in this trial. I is the intervention that was studied, C if relevant, what comparator was used, and then O, which is the outcomes, which usually uh, consists of not only the comments on survival or other benefits like response rate, but should really help clarify what are the drawbacks of treatment, what are the risks, as well as the side effects of any therapy. Not every study, as I'll present, had a comparator arm. Some of these trials were single agent studies and as such would not likely or uh, would be prematurely influencing availability of drug or even challenging standards of care, but rather point to a future direction and further trials on whether or not they were indicated. So the first trial is Paloma 3. It was presented by Nick Turner. And it was a late-breaking abstract pre uh, presented in the oral session. Uh, the P here are women with 
progressive disease on prior endocrine therapy for a hormone receptor positive breast cancer. In this trial, both pre- and postmenopausal women were enrolled. The intervention was palbociclib, which was given orally three weeks in a row, followed by a week off with fulvestrin, which is an intramuscular injection given monthly. The comparator here was fulvestrin with a placebo preparation. And in terms of who these women were specifically, this study was notable because one in five women were pre or perimenopausal. So these women had received an endocrine treatment for metastatic disease, and one in five uh, had not achieved menopause. 80% of these women had prior hormonal therapy but only a third of these women had prior chemotherapy. And looking at the population more specifically, over a third had two or more lines of prior treatment, and that means that they likely had treatment in the first line setting or adjuvant context when they were first diagnosed with breast cancer and then treatment in the metastatic setting. In terms of outcomes, we'll start with the toxicity. So comparing uh, fulvestrin with placebo, the incorporation of palbociclib with fulvestrin was associated with higher rates of neutropenia, and this could be very serious, meaning that either landed them in the hospital or else required intervention like antibiotics. But beyond that, there is no significant difference if you look at non-hematologic toxicities, and in fact, uh, they were rare in both arms, so in both the place, uh, placebo fulvestrin as well as placebo or uh, palbociclib fulvestrin arms, there were rarely experienced non-hematologic toxicity. So that is things like arthralgias, alopecia, diarrhea. In terms of survival endpoints, what you're seeing here is the progression-free survival, and um, what uh, Dr. Turner presented was the subgroup analysis. So each of these bolded criteria on your left are the subgroups in terms of age and race and menopausal status, whether or not they had visceral or non-visceral metastatic disease, so involvement of the liver and lungs, for example, whether or not prior hormonal therapy was administered, uh, whether or not they were progesterone receptor positive or negative, and how long they were disease-free, whether or not they had prior chemotherapy, and then the lines of treatment. And what you're seeing very strikingly is that all of these bars under the hazard ratio and 95% confidence interval strongly favor uh, palbociclib with fulvestrin in all except for maybe a few cases. So making the argument that this combination is a highly effective treatment for most women with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. So compared to control arm also, the combination with palbociclib increased the overall response rates and significantly increased what is termed the clinical benefit rate, which is the complete and the partial response rates as, as well as um, uh, the calculation of prolonged stable disease. What we did not get presented at this time was whether or not overall survival was different. The sole fact being that we need to follow these women for far longer before we can see what um, the impact of this treatment was in terms of the risk of death or dying of metastatic breast cancer. So the bottom line here is for women who progressed on prior endocrine therapy for a hormone receptor positive breast cancer, palbociclib and fulvestrin is a very good standard treatment option and now represents another one that is available for this population. Well, I think the strength of the study is that the progression-free survival advantage was very strong, despite the fact that the overall response rates were very small, um, and we saw very little in the way of non-hematologic toxicity differences between fulvestrin alone, uh, and um, as such, I think this is a good option for women who particularly are not looking at you wanting to use chemotherapy or maybe the decision is that their disease does not mandate the use of chemotherapy. 
this is a good choice for women who are looking at a second line hormonal treatment and it will effectively stave off the use of chemotherapy until a much later time. Moving on, we'll talk about the Marianne study, and this is Abstract 507 presented by Paul Ellis. Um, this was a, a, a trial of over a thousand uh, patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. And unlike uh, Nick Turner's study and Paloma, these were women who were receiving first line treatment of metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. So they were previously untreated. Um, although there was 1,095 patients here, um, uh, uh, 800 were status post two years of therapy, and these are the people who are essentially uh, studied in this presentation. The intervention looked at the drug TDM1 or ADO uh, uh, trastuzumab, uh, which is an antibody drug conjugate with pertuzumab as uh, the first arm versus TDM1 alone or with placebo in the second arm. So there were two interventions, and the comparison here was standard therapy, trastuzumab with a taxane, and that could have been docetaxel or paclitaxel. The primary outcome here was prog progression-free survival, and what you're seeing on this curve is no differences among the arms in terms of progression-free survival. I'll point you towards the third row here, which is the stratified hazard ratio, which gives you both um, intervention arms, TDM1 by itself or TDM1 with pertuzumab, comparing to uh, trastuzumab with a taxane, and you're seeing the hazard ratios of 0.91 and 0.87, and that uh, the numbers in parentheses are the confidence intervals, both of which cross one, which means that these differences could be attributable to chance. Uh, other outcomes that we looked at was there was no differences among the arms in terms of response rates. Uh, there was no significant differences in the duration of response, although the numbers appear fairly striking. Um, the toxicity, however, appeared to favor the use of TDM1 treatment rather than trastuzumab and taxanes. There were lower rates of alopecia, serious or febrile neutropenia, as well as diarrhea. This correlated with a, uh, an improvement in the declines in quality of life. Um, so with TDM1 therapy, there was a near doubling in time where people actually felt better before the symptoms started to impact the way they were living or the quality of life. So the bottom line here, though, is that for patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer who are looking at treatment to improve progression-free or even overall survival, there's no additional survival advantage to the use of TDM1, either alone or in combination with pertuzumab. Putting this in a bigger context, we do know that TDM1 as a second-line therapy after taxanes, or even a later line therapy after taxanes, appears to improve outcomes compared to continuation of, a, of trastuzumab. So the preferential place to use these agents may be after trastuzumab treatment and not as a, as a replacement of trastuzumab itself. Moving forward, we can go to CalGB40503. This was presented by Maura Dickler. And this was in a different population of women with locally advanced or metastatic breast cancer that was, again, hormone receptor positive. It was a smaller study at over 340 patients. It had, did allow for women who had received adjuvant endocrine therapy, but did not allow for treatment with endocrine therapy in the context of metastatic breast cancer. Here, the intervention was an aromatase inhibitor, letrozole or femara, with bevacizumab, and the comparator here was letrozole alone. And in terms of outcomes, again, looking at progression-free survival, we're seeing that uh, bevacizumab in addition to letrozole uh, uh, was associated with a gain of a four, at least of approximately four months in progression-free survival and according to the stratified hazard ratio uh, that did meet 
statistical significance because, again, the 95% confidence interval was to the left of 1.0. So this was a significant uh, result. Um, however, as we've learned with most studies of bevacizumab for breast cancer, this did not translate into a gain in overall survival. Uh, the gain here was about three months on median. However, the confidence interval here did span one. So this outcome could have been due to chance. So bevacizumab alone, or bevacizumab with letrozole, improvement progression-free but not overall survival. Uh, the combination also improved significantly overall response rates as well as that clinical benefit rate. Um, but it came at a cost of higher adverse events including serious non-hematologic toxicity, no new signals were um, encountered, so we're looking at bevacizumab, well-established toxicities including hypertension, proteinuria, as well as joint pain. So the bottom line here uh, from this study is that bevacizumab improved some outcomes uh, for women with a hormone receptor positive metastatic or locally advanced breast cancer and it does it when combined with letrozole. But as again with most studies of bevacizumab in breast cancer, it did not change overall survival and it came at a cost of uh, um, potentially serious toxicities. So moving forward to some of the promising uh, trials that were presented, Tiffany Trano from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, presented these data on enzalutamide, which is a, uh, an androgen receptor inhibitor that has approval in prostate cancer. What was interesting about this study is that she looked at it in 100 women with an advanced triple negative breast cancer. and um, she wanted to see if some of these patients which uh, who have a ER and PR negative breast cancer may still express the androgen receptor. Um, the intervention here was uh, an oral treatment of enzalutamide daily. There was no comparator in this trial. The outcome was to see what was the clinical benefit. So that's complete response, partial response, as well as uh, at least stable disease for at least four months. What she saw was that about 30% um, of patients, or one in three, experienced a serious toxicity, although of those toxicities, only about 10% were deemed to be related. The major toxicities that were seen were fatigue and dyspnea. And what was interesting even further, though, is that the clinical benefit rate at four months was 35%. Um, and at six months, it was 29%. And the overall response rate was 8%. 25% uh, of those patients had a clinical benefit, had an androgen receptor expression above 10%. And in terms of progression-free survival in both the evaluable as well as in what she termed the intent to treat population, and if you look, the evaluable patients here stayed on study, and it was 75 patients. The progression-free survival was almost four months. In the intent to treat analysis, which had far more patients, she did a stratification by androgen receptor expression. And you're seeing here that about 88%, 88 patients had AR expression of 10% or better. And there was a clear stratification of progression-free survival advantage, almost doubling if you were expressing androgen receptors. There was a separate study that was presented uh, but was associated with this trial that looked at a genomic signature for androgen receptor expression and it was termed the PREDICT AR signature and if you had that signature, again, there was a clear benefit in progression-free survival and, it, and um, even among those patients who were less heavily treated, so zero to one prior therapies, the benefit was really quite striking. 
in terms of overall survival, I thought this is also very important because it does generate the hypothesis as to can we be uh, can we treat triple negative breast cancer with more precision using enzalutamide by using this androgen receptor profile? And as you're seeing here, with enzalutamide and that androgen receptor profile, there was an overall survival advantage. In fact, of patients on this trial who had uh, the signature present, median overall survival had not been reached, but if you did not have that signature, the overall survival was 32 weeks. So the bottom line here is for women with triple negative breast cancer, we have potentially exciting results and a potential biomarker to look at an enriched population now of women with triple negative disease that express an, uh, an androgen receptor signature and uh, pointing to the potential that these patients would benefit greatly from the use of enzalutamide. This will warrant further investigation, but I think it is uh, among the more promising um, treatments that I've seen for triple negative breast cancer. Speaking on the theme of triple negative disease, there was a small, small trial of PARP inhibitors uh, in this population presented by Dr. Pahuja. It was abstract 1015. Uh, the population in this study were all, when, all patients with advanced solid tumors, but of those patients enrolled, 22 patients had a triple negative breast cancer. The intervention was the PARP inhibitor Viliparib with carboplatin and paclitaxel administered on a weekly basis. There was no comparator. This was a dose-finding study, so it was the phase one trial, and what they were able to establish was a randomized phase two dose, the RP, or I'm sorry, the recommended phase two dose, RP2D, of Viliparib at 150 milligrams uh, twice a day with weekly carbo as well as weekly paclitaxel. paclitaxel. Um, their reported results within these 22 women, again, a very small number, median progression-free survival among those patients with a mutation in BRCA was 10 months. There was no difference in that uh, uh, in median among those patients with uh, a negative BRCA mutation. But if you had an unknown BRCA mutation, it was five and a half. Unclear what this means, but again, fairly, um, fairly uh, impressive findings, particularly if you look at the overall response rate in triple negative breast cancer was 52%. Again, really too small to be conclusive at all, but does show a point of principle that perhaps using a platinum in triple, triple negative breast cancer alongside uh, a PARP inhibitor may be an effective strategy. Moving on, we'll look at a couple of supportive care abstracts. This was CalGB 7064 presented by Dr. Himmelstein. And this was a study in, all, in almost 2,000 patients with uh, bone metastases. It was open to patients with breast cancer, prostate cancer, as well as multiple myeloma, uh, 800 of whom had received two years of therapy. But the intervention here was simply to extend the um, time between infusions. So in the inter intervention arm, zoledronic acid was delivered every three months. In the comparator arm, zoledronic acid was given monthly. The outcome here was the skeletal related event rate. So those are things like fracture or worsening pain. And there was no difference between uh, every three months versus monthly treatments. It was 29% in both. There's no difference specifically in pain scores or worsening in performance status. There was rare events of osteonecrosis of the jaw. There were rare events of kidney problems. Uh, however, uh, it was a comment during the discussion of this trial that we would likely need more follow-up before we would see any differences in toxicity. So the bottom line here is that for patients who are living with bone mets, we do not need to treat them as frequently as we thought we needed to. Treatment every 12 weeks appears to be as safe as more frequent therapy. NCCTG's study, uh, N0574, 
looked at patients with brain metastases, and it was a smaller study of 200 patients who had less than three brain metastases, and each had to be small or less than three, three centimeters. Everybody got stereotactic radiosurgery, which is usually the treatment of choice for brain metastases, but there's always been this concern that unless we treat the whole brain, that outcomes might be worse. So in the intervention arm, patients got whole brain radiation as well as stereotactic radiosurgery, and the comparator here was stereotactic radiosurgery by itself. With a median follow-up of seven months, they were able to demonstrate that the addition of whole brain radiation was associated with a significantly more frequent cognitive decline, worse quality of life, and greater cognitive deterioration. However, the benefit of whole brain radiation was that um, there was a benefit in terms of disease progression intracranially, and it was a near uh, 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 fourfold improvement at three months and a threefold improvement at six months. So there was a gain in um, uh, having brain metastases not progress if we use whole brain radiation with stereotactic radiosurgery. However, also importantly, there was no difference at all in overall survival. So the bottom line here at least as my takeaway, is that for patients with one to three brain metastases, stereotactic radiosurgery is as effective as stereotactic radiosurgery with whole brain radiation. It is also better tolerated with less cognitive decline, and given that there is no overall survival advantage, uh, it sh probably should be the standard for most patients, although we would still argue that um, decisions about whole brain radiation need to be individualized. So to conclude, here are some promising leads that were also presented. Palbociclib is the first CDK4-6 inhibitor that was presented, but there are others that are on um, the horizon, and Saratolani from Dana-Farber presented one using abemocyclib that also seemed promising. And then there were also looking at these antibody drug conjugates, and one that I looked at was involving IMU, IMMU-312, which is a monoclonal antibody to the trophoblast cell surface antigen, or antitrope 2, and it's conjugated to SN38, which is an active metabolite of uh, a fairly commonly used chemotherapy in, col uh, in colon cancer called irinotecan. Um, uh, beyond those, there was some really interesting data presented at the AACR on immunotherapy and specifically looking at an anti pdl one antibody called MPDL3280A, which looked like it was active in women with triple negative breast cancer. And this was presented by Alicia Emmons of Hopkins at AACR 2015. Uh, among those patients, uh, the overall response rate was 90% and a very small number with a PFS or progression-free survival at six months. Among, again, patients with triple negative breast cancer of about 27%. Again, even in this study, very small numbers, lack of a comparator, doesn't mean this is conclusive and we should all be treating triple negative breast cancer with an anti pdl one antibody. But again, proof of principle might be here and we need to take these data further. This is just a slide looking at uh, one of the slides presented by Dr. Bardia on this drug IMMU312, which in um, the women with triple negative breast cancer showed a 31% response rate. And what, you're sh what he showed here was a really striking example of a, a metastatic disease involving the breast and the chest wall in this one patient, and what, you're, what is circled in panel A is some axillary adenopathy, which is quite significant, and in panel C, you see it shrink down quite significantly as well, and in panel B, you're seeing actual clearance of some axillary adenopathy as well as some mediastinal adenopathy, and if you look at D, um, the area actually looks quite clean, and um, she has continued uh, treatment um, 
as of May of 2015 with a striking 60% shrinkage in her tumors. Again, these are anecdotes. Doesn't prove that this drug is going to be any better than standard of care, but again, really promising results for a woman with metastatic disease um, that is also triple negative. So I think I'm hoping I can convince you that um, we are making progress. And what struck me about uh, the ASCO annual meeting is that this progress was no longer being seen in studies looking at all breast cancers as one disease. We are looking at now studies being done in specifically defined populations, whether it be HER2 positive or hormone receptor positive, as well as in triple negative breast cancer. And I think we're going to see more of those kinds of studies. We're probably going to be looking at more precision-based treatments, just like the enzalutamide study, looking, um, which is showing that perhaps a subgroup of women with triple negative breast cancer who have an A androgen receptor signature may be the patients we need to look at for enzalutamide. Um, we are also seeing an, a com continued emphasis of quality of life in terms of the approach to women with metastatic disease, whether that be in the bones or brain or elsewhere. But above all else, I think we can look at these results and show that hope is indeed continues to be on the horizon for women with metastatic breast cancer. And with that, I'll close. And thank you very much for asking me to, to join you today. Christina, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Dr. Dizon. Uh, so a couple of questions have come in. And yep. just a moment. Can the zolandronic acid outcome be extended to patients on Exgeva? Yes, so that's a really important question, and the answer is no. Exegeva is, is, is a quite a different drug from the bisphosphonates, but I will say that right now uh, there is interest in sort of uh, trying to explore whether or not the same principle of extended therapy does does um, extend to what's called the rank ligand inhibitors, which is what um, exegeva is, rather than a bisphosphonate. So because of the mechanism of action, in fact, how the, the drug was manufactured and, and, and um, the type of drug it is, I'm not sure. In fact, I would probably say I would not extrapolate these results for zoologic acid to exegeva at this time. Again, I think for folks on zoologic acid, the issue has arisen because this does require trips to an infusion unit to get it as an intravenous infusion. And so if there's a way we can back off on folks going to the infusion unit less frequently, it may actually help them um, not only financially, but just in terms of uh, coordination of care and and just interrupting their life, uh, really, because of the more frequent visits for infusional therapies. Exegeva is given as an injection, so that pressure to, to give it, it may not be as great, but still, it is a, a quite an expensive therapy, and I do believe that there are still some studies looking at how uh, the optimal timing of Exegeva therapies. Thank you. So another question, is there any active research on non BRCA germline mutations such as BRIP1? Yes, that's an interesting question. So um, we are now recognizing that BRCA mutations are not the only genes that, that are associated with an increase in, in uh, the risk of breast cancer. But that field is really quite premature. Um, for example, although we know that there are mutations, PALB2 might even be some of the um, um, uh, uh, mutations in the repair pathways that are, uh, that are affected, uh, like RAD1. Um, we don't know yet how our interventions uh, uh, impact subsequent rest. So will a prophylactic mastectomy protect as much as it does in a BRCA mutation. Indeed, what ages should patients, if they are going to consider prophylactic mastectomy, do they need to do it younger 
older or at the same age. Um, so I think what we're going to see probably in the next uh, five years is a better understanding and a maturation of what these other genes do in terms of breast cancer risk. And until we sort of understand that, we can't necessarily understand yet how to interfere with breast cancers after those other mutations. So I think we are probably in our first, you know, baby steps in terms of understanding other genes that are associated with breast cancer. And we're going to look to the mutations in BRCA to lead the way of how this whole the field can develop. Recognize that PARP inhibitor is well available for mutations for for women with cancers related to mutations in BRCA. There is none yet available for breast cancer associated with mutations in BRCA in uh, Olaparib, which was the first to be approved for BRCA mutation carriers, has a very specific approval for women with ovarian cancer. So then another question is, should uh, MBC, should metastatic breast cancer patients have genomic testing? And if so, how many or what genes should be tested? That's a complicated question. Um, the answer I would say is, if there are therapies locally available, then I think genomic testing makes sense. The issues um, that come up with that is right now the, the, the commercially available genomic tests don't allow us to choose which genes we want to in, interrogate. So, for example, Foundation Medicine will give you a whole list of genes that are tested on any specific tumor. Now, there is a study that was just launched by the National Cancer Institute, which is called the MATCH trial, which is looking at patient um, tumor mutations and trying to get them into this very large umbrella study, which is, has multiple arms, multiple drugs, looking at multiple different mutations. Um, at the Mass General, we will generally use genomic sequencing in our phase one group to help target patients to specific drugs based on tumor biology. As a general rule, that's the only place where I'm actually using genomic testing. And in the absence of a clinical trial or in the absence of, um, uh, uh, of uh, good standard therapies, um, I find uh, next generation sequencing or genomic testing in, in metastatic disease of fairly limited value. So the bottom line is if there is something we can do with the results, it does make sense to do. A lot of our trials, just like in the um, androgen receptor study, there is a genomic biomarker that's being attached or, or being proposed as, as something that can help identify patients to uh, who, who will benefit for this trial. In those kinds of cases, the trial may be specific as to what biomarker will be tested. And even if you have a genomic sequence, you may still need to undergo a, a test specific to the trial. So again, I think it just depends on what we are planning to do with that information. That should be the general role in terms of genomic sequencing of anyone's tumor. Thank you. So uh, just an additional follow-up question on that. Um, how frequently should tumors be biopsied? Uh, that's, um, again, a really great question. There's a, a sense in some other fields uh, in, in uh, oncology like melanoma that as tumors get treated, other mutations may, um, may become manifest. So serial biopsies are being used on clinical trials in melanoma to help sequence therapies in a rational way. Uh, it does make sense in melanoma because there has been this um, explosion of new therapies for the disease. Um, in general, I, I um, do try to get biopsies on women when they first present with metastatic disease. I consider doing biopsies in cases of a mixed response 
i.e. patients who have, say, liver metastases as well as uh, bone metastases or a lung metastasis, if their uh, um, subsequent scans on a treatment show responses in some but not others, it might be worthwhile to biopsy the non-responding lesion and see how the, how the DNA in, uh, has changed. But again, it does uh, tend to uh, um, uh, be determined by how many options do I have available and do I need new biologic information to make that decision. So right now serial biopsying is something that we're strongly considering doing on trials. The MATCH trial is actually incorporating serial biopsies so that if someone goes on arm A of this trial because they have mutation X and then she progresses, a repeat biopsy uh, is being done in that trial to see if she can go on another arm of the study. Right. <clears throat> and I heard a little bit at ASCO about multiple multiple site biopsies. So uh -huh. taking, taking samples from the same tumor from different locations. Can you talk about that a yeah. little bit? Well, it's, a, it's along the same lines. So the, what we struggle with, is, um, and it's probably uh, clinically uh, true, is that tumors are very heterogeneous. So just because you have a HER2 positive breast cancer probably doesn't mean that all of the cells in that cancer express HER2. So it's that heterogeneity that's driving this multi-site biopsies to try to better understand the, the heterogeneity of a tumor. Again, it's going to really, um, it may be opening Pandora's box in a sense though, because if, if a tumor expresses HER2 in say some cells or in one tumor and it doesn't in another tumor, are you really not going to give HER2 therapy? I would argue you would because we're always trying to use that information to identify patients who should get trastuzumab rather than who should not. But the whole context there of multi-site biopsies is really to get a better understanding of tumors from a more global perspective and in terms of trying to identify the heterogeneity of those tumors. Mm -hmm. And someone is asking, when no tumor is present, how do you test and monitor metastatic disease? So if no tumors are present, how do you test them for? How do you test and monitor metastatic disease? Oh, if someone doesn't have tumor present um, or does not have symptoms present, then uh, I think the bottom line is that there is no rush to start therapy. So in, in general, for patients with metastatic disease, I will begin treatment for either radiographic or um, radiological findings and or tumor-related symptoms. If someone does not have those things, then I will oftentimes observe them and just have them under very close surveillance. To me, close surveillance is monthly examinations and histories. It's not, I'll see you in six months. It is actually I'll see you in four weeks. And usually those visits in a very frequent period are useful because you can get an idea or a sense alongside my patient of how the tempo of change is occurring. And then also together we can make a shared decision on how often and when imaging should be performed. Thank you. And several people are asking about any kind of research being done in metastatic lobular breast cancer. Right. You know, so lobular breast cancers, we're, we're actually, um, I don't know of any specific uh, studies being done in lobular. What we're really, I think, what you've seen in ASCO is um, uh, less uh, of uh, diseases focused in on histology, so no diseases in, in, in looking at ductal carcinomas versus lobular carcinomas. What we're seeing is the start of trials based on um, uh, histological features, so hormone receptors, HER2 positivity, um, 
these are the things that really caught my eye. Um, there are, it, it's very rare to see studies, particularly in metastatic disease, by histology. Um, I think in general there's a sense that metastatic disease, whether it started as lobular or as ductal, uh, the, the behavior of these, these tumors are likely being driven by either mutations, by ex receptor expression, or by um, other biological means. Thank you. So um, someone is wondering if metastatic breast cancer in males, if the treatment would be different than treatment that's recommended for women. Um, the biggest way that treatment is different for men with breast cancer is the choices of hormonal therapies. Um, we generally will administer tamoxifen rather than the aromatase inhibitors in men, particularly as a first-line therapy. Part of that might be historical, but it, um, there's some very small data sets suggesting that maybe the AIs are not as effective. In terms of the treatment in um, metastatic male breast cancer, again, it's going to be driven mostly by the, 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 the genomic or uh, histologic signature of that tumor. So we would be treating a hormone receptor or triple negative breast cancer the same in a man as well as in a woman with metastatic disease. Same thing goes with triple negative disease. Um, some clarification may be necessary if it's hormone receptor positive, i.e. the use of tamoxifen versus an aromatase inhibitor. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions here about um, drug resistance. So can you explain okay. why AIs sometimes just stop working? Right. Um, you know, I think the field of drug resistance in metastatic breast cancer is actually um, one that's also an evolution. We're, we don't really um, have a great sense of what uh, the mechanisms, probably because there's multiple mechanisms, are of drug resistance to the aromatase inhibitors. It might be, um, you know, if you look at tamoxifen, we know that there may be changes in the estrogen receptor that that um, make it resistant to tamoxifen. Um, where we probably still need to do a lot more work into the drug resistance of these agents that are being used to treat breast cancer. Um, so there's no easy or simple answer to why one gets, quote, resistant to an AI. Okay, thank you. So someone is saying that basket trials was kind of a yeah. buzzword that came out of ASCO. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. The basket trials is essentially like, like the NCI's match trial, and essentially, you know, if anybody has ever um, participated in a clinical trial, the usual phase two trial is a single arm study. Usually, it takes about 30 to 40 patients, and it's run. Um, it's one arm, and it's done, you know, serially. So you open one phase two study, then you can open a. Uh, when that's done, you open your uh, another phase two study, and it takes a lot of time. And and there's a, this recognition that progress can be very slow with with these uh, serially run phase two trials, uh, particularly as we're now looking at uh, more uh, targeted therapies, trying to find people who fit a certain phenotype that might predict that a specific drug will respond might be quite difficult. So what the NCI and other institutions have done, I think some of our pharma companies have even done, is that they try to create a master protocol where um, multiple arms are embedded in the trial. Each arm can open and close based on uh, results, um, but it's, it's sort of a master protocol uh, for patients to enter and an arm is identified 
specific to the patient's genomic results. So in the MATCH trial, uh, say you have um, a, a BRCA mutation and they have a novel PARP inhibitor, you would preferentially be placed into that, tr that arm of the trial rather than randomly assigned to another arm of that study and then um, we would follow you to see how your results are. It is very also similar to the iSpy2 trials which, you know, is looking at drugs and trying to match the patient or the drug in terms of the iSpy trial, what they're doing is called adaptive randomization. So, you know, while the first few patients may be randomly assigned to any of the arms, there's a planned analysis to see if a pattern emerges in each of the arms and if they can identify a pattern of responders, then the trial adapts so that patients who then subsequently meet the criteria that seems to predict response only will go into the arm of interest. Um, but the whole notion of an, an umbrella or a basket trial is to try to pool resources to do these cross-oncology clinical trials to answer biologic questions in the fastest way possible. So there are so many, so many more questions. I know we only have five minutes. Uh, I, I wish that we could answer all the questions, but. I, I think probably we have time for maybe just a couple more. So someone is wondering if you are originally on a hormonal treatment, then go to chemotherapy, when and if that fails, can you then go back to hormonal treatment? The answer is quite simply yes, um, and we, we sometimes will do that. Um, so much goes into the, sort of the choice of treatment at any one particular point in time. Um, you know, it might be, you know, um, you went from endocrine therapy to chemotherapy because liver mets developed and there was a sense that we need to get it under control, for example. In that case, chemotherapy may be the quickest way of achieving a response, but say then that uh, treatment ended up being toxic to you two to six months later, in which case you might need a break, although that is not something that you'll necessarily want. We can retry endocrine therapy after that point. Really, there's no rules that govern the choices of treatment, and I think with the vast um, uh, options that are seen for women with metastatic breast cancer, the way to be treated is a highly, highly individualized way. But for women with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, endocrine therapy is something I always and will continue to think about as an option for them. Okay, great. So someone someone's asking about um, long-term effects for metastatic patients with uh, bone metastasis only. Is there a higher incidence of stroke or heart disease associated with long-term use of hormonals? Um, it depends on the hormonal therapy. We know that tamoxifen, for example, will will increase the risk of venous thrombosis or, or um, a cardiovascular disease. We haven't seen the same with the aromatase inhibitors thus far, but the aromatase inhibitors, again, can cause increases in the risk of a fracture. Um, Tamoxifen can cause an increase in, in cardiovascular events, but some of the aromatase inhibitors have been associated with um, worsening lipid profiles. So again, I think the whole notion that endocrine therapy is benign is not true. There can be some health-related effects apart from cancer that can be induced. Um, so that the, um, the decision about hormonal therapy, how even chemotherapy has to be highly individualized. Okay. Several people are asking about, about fatigue, that uh, they're really struggling with fatigue. Do you have any suggestions about how they can deal more effectively with this? Yeah. Um, you know, I, fatigue is often not uh, a symptom that, that's, that um, occurs in isolation. I oftentimes will try to look for secondary um, exacerbating factors. It might be distress, it might be anxiety, it might be depression, it might be insomnia. Um, 
so I think a lot of the things we would should try to do is try to look for other associated symptoms that might be contributing to fatigue mm -hmm. and, and getting those things addressed, whether it be with, you know, anxiolytics or antidepressants or even something as, as, as simple as um, uh, looking at sleep hygiene. Um, uh, I think for most patients, if they are experiencing distress, my practice has been to refer early on to palliative care for symptom management, not for hospice. Um, but because I do think, and my experience has been, patients who get plugged into palliative care early also have better quality quality of life. Um, pharmacologically, things that can help with fatigue are short courses of steroids like dexamethasone. Um, I haven't had that much luck in terms of um, uh, 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 psychostimulants in terms of fatigue. Um, uh, but I would strongly favor mind-body or complementary therapies. Exercise can also be a very good therapy for fatigue, and it doesn't mean you have to run a marathon when you feel exhausted. It does mean walking um, consistently, um, maybe even you know two or three um, or, or half a mile, I should say. Uh, but remaining active is actually one of the things that can help with fatigue. And then looking for secondary causes is also really important. Thank you. It was very comprehensive, and I, I hope uh, some people can find some relief. So thank you so much. Dr. Don was a great, great program. You packed a lot of information into the short time that we had together, and you answered so many questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions. Uh, this will be available. A recording of this uh, webinar will be available, and you will all receive a link to that recording. So I would just uh, like to, again, thank Dr. Dizon for your, your time and putting this presentation together and for being with us today, and to the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network for always being willing to partner with 